start with uh, Louis Castillo. Uh, Louis Castillo is principal investigator for the Muslim Youth in New York City Public Schools Project at Columbia University's Teacher College, uh, which is a three-year study of Muslim youth in public schools, especially in a post-9-11 environment. Um, this is, will be much of what he's speaking about tonight. He's also the project coordinator for Columbia University's Muslims in New York City Project, a groundbreaking multidisciplinary study that explores Muslim identity and community building in New York City. Uh, he's on the faculty at Teachers College, and he's published articles in and been interviewed by in many different publications, including the New York Times, the Arab American News, the Christian Science Monitor, Newsday, MSNBC, probably others that I don't have here. And if you just want to mention, in the back are these two, sorry, I'm going to over and move yourself. <laughs> these two books here. Uh, one is, this is where I need to be, Oral Histories of Muslim Youth in New York City. And then this is the curriculum guide that's come out of uh, the Muslim Youth in New York City Public School Studies. These are both available back there on the table together with a lot more information. So let me hand it, uh, this point to Dr. Castillo.
which is built on the principles of pluralism and democracy and freedom of justice for all, not just for a majority, but for all. Um, and I think contextualizing Islamophobia and this notion of culture wars is important because when we think of a culture, a war, a cultural war, we think, well, it's just ideas, right? It's the ideas, the norms, the values of a, maybe a dominant group that feels that uh, another group, another group's norms, and values, and beliefs, and practices are opposing that of the, the norm of the dominant group. Hence, we get these, these, these wars taking place. But the, the issue here is, what's the next step? You go from the rhetoric, the ideas, into actual policies, you see? Because ideas, and that's what culture's about, culture's ideas and symbols that we all share, right? Well, what happens when those ideas, which are really just staging points for action, what happens when those ideas translate into action into policy? For example, we corral Native Americans on the reservations and force them, uh, and force schooling design to eliminate their indigenous languages and eradicate their cultures in the name of assimilation. What about the Jim Crow laws, excluding blacks from any of the social, educational, economic, and political rights that everyone else shared? What about the Oriental Exclusion Act of 1917? And the Johnson Act of 1924 that banned most non-Europeans, that is, non-Caucasians. And the U.S. Supreme Court decided in uh, 1870 that if you were non-European, you were not Caucasian, you were not white. And that subjected you to suspicion as to whether you should be a citizen or not in the United States. Anti-Catholic sentiment, anti-Semitic prejudice in higher education in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement of women, who, not, who until 1920 gained, finally gained the right to vote. Uh, don't ask, don't tell. It means a gay person is conserved and die for the country, but they have to keep their sexual orientation in the closet, in the double bag, maybe. Uh, Anti-immigrant legislation, Arizona Senate Bill 1070, which in, in a sense legalizes racial profiling by citizens and the Latinos. So all these things started with, in, in the context of culture war of ideas, but these ideas led to policies that are disenfranchising or have disenfranchised minorities in America. So you might be wondering that, well, what do Muslim children think about their future? That's serious. So, uh, this is more than an opening statement. I'm doing a bit of a, an education here, so may I? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, a little bit about the, the Muslim population in New York City. And New York City is home to some 600, about 700,000 uh, Muslims, African Americans, whose numbers may be about 150,000, African American Muslims, whose numbers may be about 150,000, uh, are about 20 to 25 percent of the Muslims in New York City, followed by smaller numbers of Latinos and non Hispanic whites. Uh, who are uh, converts, who account for maybe 10%. About three quarters of all Muslims in New York City are foreign born and their children. And, and foreign born Muslims account for about 17%, 17 to 20% of all foreign born New Yorkers in the city. How many, how, then when, how, 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 what, what percentage of the New York City population is foreign born? I have to tell you the trend. Yeah, it's about 35 percent yeah, quite. Yeah, they asked me to tell One out of three persons is actually foreign born. So 70% of those, 17 20% are actually Muslim. <clears throat> there are nearly 200 mosques, over a dozen private full time Muslim schools, and countless community based organizations that dot the five boroughs in New York City. Okay. New York City is a very. Uh, you can, go ahead. Uh, New York City is uh, so, uh, a, uh, a gateway, obviously, for immigration. Um, and it's been home for Muslims for decades and decades, if not centuries. This is something that the Islam foes don't recognize. Many of the Muslims that they're, they're harking against, uh, their ancestors were here long before their ancestors came over on boats. Um, so you have in the uh, 16th through the, 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 the mid 19th century, uh, you had West Africans coming over, about, uh, about 1.5 million from West Africa, who were in fact Muslim uh, and wound up in the, the uh, slave trade in North America. Go ahead. In uh, the 19th, early 20th century, you had indentured service. Uh, you had Indian Muslims who were uh, coming into the Americas, in the, the Caribbean, um, to uh, work on the plantations after the British had banned slavery, but they allowed workers to come over from Gujarat, 
in parts of India, their colonies, uh, to work on their farms, basically as indentured servants. And today, Guyanese Muslims uh, in Richmond Hill now constitute the largest diaspora community of Guyanese, the second largest diaspora community of Guy Guyanese in North America, except for Canada. All right. Um, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Arab and uh, Turkish Muslims uh, in the latter part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century, uh, were coming over as uh, uh, business entrepreneurs and, and settling here. Many going back, but establishing their communities right here in New York City. Okay. Many of these were Arab Christians, uh, but included some Muslims uh, as well. Okay, go ahead. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, by 1924, uh, the United States decided that that's enough. Uh, we're going to bar the Asiatics, non whites. And from 1924 to 1965, if you were non-white, you really weren't welcome in the States. Okay. So, uh, now the issue here is, and this is something that Islam folks, again, don't recognize, um, is that America in, in 2010 is very different from the America in the 1950s, just after World War II, uh, when Will Herbert wrote his, his seminal work on immigration and assimilation in America. Uh, Protestant Catholic Jew, uh, an essay on American religious so uh, sociology. And essentially, he never anticipated that the new immigration after 65, you have all this religious diversity now, non Christian, you have Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus, etc., coming into the United States now, adding to the diversity of the fabric in the United States. And Herbert never anticipated this. That's why he based his theory of assimilation that all these Europeans, all the different cultures and language, etc., would essentially assimilate into one English-speaking community, and what would make them diverse? What, 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 what bit of diversity would remain? Religion. So we always speak English, all the Americans, American values and norms, uh, but all, the, the, all the, the traditions and customs and languages of the homeland, uh, for generations, several generations, they would vanish, and what would remain are our, our religious identities, that enduring primordial sort of sense of connection with your religion. All right? uh, so he imagined that eventually, well, if America will be American religious diversity will characterize by Muslim, uh, you know, no, by, by uh, pre, uh, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. He did not anticipate the change after 1965. All right? There's all this religious diversity now. But people who are Islamophobic are still thinking that America is really white and European and Christian and so on and so forth. So again, this is culture wars again. All right. So um, let's hear let's hear a little bit about Muslims then, uh, Muslim youth. Today there are about 110,000 estimated Muslim youth in the New York City school system. Uh, that's about 12 percent of the University uh, school based population. In some neighborhoods, in Brooklyn and Queens, where population density of Muslim households may be quite high, uh, enrollment in some of the elementary schools, middle schools, may be as much as 20% Muslim. Um, only about 4% of all school-aged Muslim children are in the private Islamic schools. 96% of all Muslim kids are in our public schools. But they're learning American civics, American history, American civ uh, 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 civic and political uh, values, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, now, survey results from our, our, our research that we conducted from 2005 to 2008. We did surveys, a national a statewide survey, and focus groups. The re results uh, of, this, of this research indicated that Muslim children have a strong sense of American identity and place as much or greater value towards civic and political engagement and participation as do their non-Muslim peers in the schools. Yet, they are very worried. Islamophobia is becoming for them more, uh, more pervasive in, in, in popular discourse on Main Street, and they fear that this is alienating